So this week we're doing a Parsha's Chai Sara. Last week we finished oh, we're on page uh, 106. 106 in the Art Scroll Chumash. Last week we finished with the. Uh, oh, this is something she gave us. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, you can look at it. Yeah. What did you say? 106? Oh, 106, yeah. yeah. So last week we finished with the uh, the Akedah. That was where Avraham took Yitzchak up to Mount Moriah and bound him as a sacrifice, was ready to sacrifice him, and the angel said, don't do it, and he sacrificed the ram instead. So where we get the shofar, and then this week's parsha, uh, Sarah Imenu, our our matriarch, foremother. I don't know if foremother is a word. Uh, Avraham's wife passes away, and then Avraham has to haggle to buy Ma'ar uh, Samach which is in Hebron, which you can visit today, to bury Sarah. And then um, y- uh, y- Avraham needs a, a wife for Yitzchak, so he sends his servant Eliezer to go and to. Uh, find a wife for Yitzchak from his relatives, and we find Rivka, and they get married, and Avram remarries, and then Avram passes away, and that's the general um, summary, quick summary of the Parsha. So let's get started and discuss. There's a lot of interesting things that uh, we find in this week's Parsha. So let's start with the first Pasuk here. It says, Vayu chai sara, mea shana, ve'esrim shana, ve'sheva shanim, shnei chai sara. It says that the years of Sarah were 100 years, and 20 years, and 7 years. Those were the years of Sarah. So that's a very interesting way to say that someone was 127 years old by saying she was 100 years old, and 20 years old, and 7 years old. Um, so let's look at Rashi, who points this out right away on the bottom. He says... It says years after each one. That each year... Years, group of years that is mentioned, should uh, teaches us a lesson. Bas kuf kabas chaflechet. When she was a hundred years old, it was like she was twenty for sin. Now, why twenty? Because even though a person, a man, gets bar mitzvah at thirteen, and a woman at twelve, that's when they are liable in um, bezdin in the Jewish court for offenses that were committed. They can get punished in court when a boy is thirteen, when a girl is twelve, because girls mature faster. So they tell me, um, it's true, and. Uh, but 20, that's, there are certain punishments, that's on uh, a, a level of human punishments that the court can inflict, but there are other punishments that God inflicts, right? There are certain things in the Torah that if a person violates, Hashem um, meets out divine punishment. Those punishments a person only gets when he is 20. So that's why it says uh, 20 over here. And then it says when she was 20, Mabas Chaf, Lochata Shahri Eina of Mabas Anchen, Af Bas Kuf Belochet. So, but Sarah, when she was 100 years old, she was so pure that she was like a 20-year-old who had never sinned. So she lived her whole life without really, uh, without sinning, without sin. And when she was 20, she was like a 7-year-old for beauty. So the first one I understand very well. That's a praise of Sarah. She was, when she was 100, she was as pure as she was 20 as, as for sin. When she was 20, she was as beautiful as a 7-year-old. Why do we care about her physical beauty? Why does that matter? It's something that always bothered me, Right? It's very nice, right? There's a lot of beautiful people in the world that are very ugly inside, and a lot of uh, there's also beautiful people on the outside and the inside, and you have ugly people on the outside and the inside. But uh, why is this a praise of her that she was beautiful like a seven-year-old, and why specifically like a seven-year-old? So I was very happy this year. I finally saw an answer to this question from Rabbi Einstetter. He's a rabbi in Cleveland who's actually also a very prominent English professor. It's a very, very, very. Um, yeah. It's a very unique uh, combination. Thank you. So, I'm gonna. There's another, actually, another Gemara. This is not the only time when you find the Torah and the Mefarshim talking about uh, someone's beauty, a great person's beauty. It says also that Shufrei Durav Kahana, talking about the Amarayim, these are the rabbis that are in the Talmud who are also very holy people. They lived right at probably the 300s, the 400s. That's who we study in the Talmud. So it says, The beauty of Rav Kahana, Me'ain Shufra de Rabbi Avohu. The beauty of Rav Kahana was like the beauty of Rabbi Avohu. And the beauty of Rav Avohu was like the beauty of Yaakov Avinu, right? Jacob, our forefather. And the beauty of Jacob, our forefather, was like the beauty of Adam Harishan, of, uh, of Adam. Oh, hey. Welcome, welcome. So, so we just started Chai Sarah. We're asking why, um, why, why does Rashi point out that Sarah was very beautiful? Why, uh, why, why is that an important thing? And we just saw, we quoted Gemara Bava Basra that the Amoraim, the Talmudic rabbis, were very beautiful. And some of them were, they were be- and the, beautif- the beauty was similar to the beauty of Yaakov, which was similar to the beauty of other Mauritian. So the answer is, is that when a, when a person was on such a high level that they, of spiritual perfection, that they served Hashem so purely, oh, there's Chumashim over there, if you want. 
that they served Hashem so purely and their only goal in life was to serve Hashem and to not sin and to care about other people, their holiness was so much that their beauty expressed itself on the outside also. Right? When someone was that beautiful, uh, someone was that holy, their beauty I- even manifested in a physical beauty. Um, definitely mentioned this before, that uh, a photographer in Israel told my rabbi that you know, the great rabbis, they have a glow. And when she takes their pictures, she can sometimes see the glow on the film, but the, she always doesn't capture it on the film. And I once took uh, a friend of mine to make Havdalah by uh, Rav Yashiv, who was the greatest rabbi in the world up until he passed away eight years ago, or something like that. And when I took my friend there, he looked at the rabbi and he's like, whoa, he's glowing. He just like had a certain holiness that you could see. And sometimes when you see children also, I think you see this, that they don't have children who have never sinned. They're not responsible for their sins. They're just a pure innocence. And that's why Rabbi Einstein points out, it's specifically comparing the beauty of these great rabbis to the beauty of Adam, the Adam before he sinned, who was a being that was created totally complete from God. And before he sinned, he was on a very uh, totally beautiful level. And I think also you see, some, sometimes you speak to people, right? And if you, they turn out to be a nice person, they become more beautiful as you speak to them. And if they, sometimes they start out beautiful, and if they're not nice people, they become less beautiful. But I think the, uh, with Rabbi, Rabbi, I believe what Rabbi Einstein is saying here is that the reason that Rashi is expressing, the, the Medrash is expressing the beauty of Sarah was because she was on such a high spiritual level that it even uh, came out in her physical beauty. Okay, so let's go on to the next Pasuk. It says, V'tamas Sarah b'kiryas arba. She died in Kiryas Arba. He Hebron, Be'eretz Canaan. It's in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Vayavo Avraham lispod l'sara v'liv kosa. And Avraham came to eulogize Sarah and to cry over her. Now, if you notice, the uh, chaf over here is, uh, is small. Mm-hmm. When it says that he cried over her. Right. So what is the reason for that? So someone just told me today, his name is Rabbi Yisrael Shulman, I study with him. If you'll notice here in Rashi, it says, Lispod l'sara v'liv kosa, in Pasuk Beis, I'll, I'll read it and translate it. Nismacha misa sara l'akedis Yitzchak. The, as we mentioned before, in the last week's parsha we read about the Akedah where Avraham went up to the, um, to, the, uh, to the mountain and bound Yitzchak to sacrifice. Now, the, we read about Sarah's death after we read about that. Because Lafisha Ayide Basaras Hakeda Shin is Damin Benal Shita, Ukamach Lonishat, Parchanish Masri Meno Mesa. It's actually why Sarah died when she heard that Abraham almost sacrificed Yitzchak, then Sarah died because of that shock. So the reason that the letter is small is to signify that while Avraham was very sad and obviously distressed the fact that Sarah passed away, he didn't regret the fact that he listened to Hashem and doing the Akedah. That at the same time, he had that feeling of being very sad that his wife died. He uh, did not regret fulfilling a mitzvah of Hashem. Now, someone else told me that they saw from the Vilna Gon that when one mourns, the, uh, they mourn for two things. Mourn because the person's not here, they physically died. And two, because the, maybe the person didn't complete their mission in life. Right? A person has however amount of years he has in this world to serve Hashem and to make a tikkun to fix whatever he's got to fix up. And maybe the person died and wasn't able to fix and do everything that he had to do. However, Avraham was confident and knew that Sarah did whatever she had to do. She was such a spiritually perfect person that whatever needed fixing, she fixed up. He was, so Avraham was only mourning for the physical loss of Sarah, but not the spiritual component. And that's why the letter is small, to, sign, to signify that it wasn't a total mourning. Now, after that, we read, Avraham wanted to um, have a place to bury Sarah. And if you read, if you keep, if you look, it goes on for a very long time, about a page. And we know that the, uh, the Torah doesn't waste the letter, right? There are certain laws in the Torah that are learned from like an extra letter. And the Talmud derives laws from an extra letter, or from a lack of a letter, or even from what are called drushas, and the Torah doesn't even speak it out. Why does the Torah go on for such a long time to talk about a burial plot? Right, that was bought for Sarah. It seems like a very ancillary thing that's not so integral to the uh, narrative over here. So the Malbim writes, I saw this from Rabbi uh, Abbot Svinayman, who came to the JLC a few weeks ago to speak. Um, he writes from the Malbim that Avraham was trying to teach us a lesson, tried to teach the Jewish people a lesson, that the soul lives on. That don't think that we're only here for the here and now, and that after we die, everything is gone. He was trying to tell us that the soul lives forever, and the Jewish soul and every soul lives forever. And that's why there's so much stress on buying a burial plot, because people bury, we bury the dead as an honor 
for the dead, right? If the people just died and that was it, you could just discard the bodies and who cares? But since we believe that the soul lives on and the person is still around in a spiritual state and also that the person will be resurrected after, uh, after Mashiach comes, that's why the Torah goes to such great lengths to describe the um, purchase of the burial plot for Sarah. Now what's interesting also is that Adam and Chava, right, Adam and Eve, were also buried here in Mar Samach Pela. And this is where all of the uh, forefathers and the matriarchs, the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. It's also interesting, uh, this is just a political commentary a little bit, that this is like such a controversial place in Israel now, um, you know, between the Jews and the Arabs, and this is like the one place in the Torah that's actually super explicit that Avraham bought it, you know, for, for, uh, for that, which is uh, interesting. Now, Now, it's interesting, if you, the Talmud in uh, Kedushin describes, how, do you, how, do you, how does a Jewish man marry a Jewish woman? Right? What's, the, what's the halachic process? The man gives the woman a ring or a, something of value. Right? It's called uh, Kedushin, Kedushin Kesef. The man gives something of value to the woman and they are married. And the Talmud actually derives the type of um, uh, Kenyan that is needed, the procedure that's needed for the marriage from this story of... Um, of Avraham buying the cave to bury Sarah. So what's the connection between that? That's what Rabbi Naaman is discussing again. What's the connection between ma- Jewish marriage, which is derived from the acquisition of this cave? Now, let me just one second. Okay, so before that, I'm going to go on a tangent for one second and hopefully bring it back. And if it doesn't make sense, please uh, stop me. There's another prohibition in the Torah called Lo Sis Godedu, that when someone dies, you are not allowed to... Um, Cut your flesh. We're not allowed to cut our flesh, right? When people used to be so brokenhearted, idolaters, so brokenhearted when someone dies, they would cause physical marks in their body to show how upset they were and how much how grieved uh, they were. There is a negative prohibition in the Torah that we are not allowed to do that. What's the reason? The reason is is because we know that when a person dies, it's not like he's totally gone. The soul lives on. So if you are cutting your flesh and dis- mourning more than is necessary, it's showing that you don't believe in the eternality of the soul. Of course we mourn. Everyone mourns when they lose a loved one. It's only natural. But to mourn to the extent we're actually going to cause a physical wound in the body, that is something which is prohibited because it shows you don't believe in the eternal nature of the soul. Now, there's another mitzvah which is derived from this lo go to do, which seemingly has nothing to do with it. That is, there's a prohibition to have different, there's a lot of details, and uh, so I'm not going to get into it because I don't know them all, but uh, Losis Godedu means you're not also, the Talmud derives, you're not allowed to have different practices going on in the Jewish people. You can't have different customs. The, the Jewish people in general has to be a cohesive unit. Now, unit. now obviously, we do have um, different customs, so it doesn't apply to everything. It applies to certain things. Um, the, mo- the biggest time you'll see this is on that on Cholomoe, like on Pesach or Sukkot. Some people put on tefillin, and some people don't put on tefillin. Right? Different customs. So what you'll have is very often you'll have a mechitza, in the middle, and you'll have the tefillin folks over here and the non-tefillin folks over there, because you don't want to have the mixing, because it looks like, oh, look, all the Jews have different customs, so they separate. Now, what is the fact that the Jews shouldn't have different customs and, and different things like that have to do with the prohibition of cutting oneself and not mourning more than necessary over the dead? So Rabbi Naaman writes, oh, this actually, I think, is from the Avni Nezer, that they're both related, because the Jewish people, while we're all individuals, there's something called Nishmas Yisrael, the, 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 the Jewish soul. We all have a collective Jewish soul, and we're all connected as Jews. So f- when you have different customs going on, it shows a separation between the Jewish soul, and that's, don't, that's not what we want. We want all the Jewish soul to be together and Nishma Yisrael to be connected. And that's why it's related to Losis go to do this prohibition of cutting oneself, because you're showing you don't believe in the eternality of the soul. Now, what happens in a marriage? In a marriage, two halves of a soul join together. That's what happens in a marriage. Now, what was Avram Avinu doing here? Why, why did we say that he's spending, with the Torah spending so much time discussing how he acquired this Ma'ar Samach Pela, this cave to bury Sarah, was to demonstrate that the soul lives on. So that's why we learn from this episode of the Ma'ar Samach Pela to the laws of marriage. Because just like Avraham was teaching here, the eternal nature of the soul, that's what happens in marriage, the two halves of the soul uh, joined together. Was that clear? That was a lot of... Good. Any questions? Okay, I hope I explained that. Okay. All right, let's go to page 108. Moving right along. 24.1. So this is Avraham Zakeng Baba Yamim. Avraham was old. 
along in days, Vashem Beirach es Avraham Akol, and Hashem blessed Avraham with everything. So now, why does it say that he was Baba Yamim? He was um, he was old and he was along in days. What is with the extra thing that he was well on in years or well on in days? So I heard this today from Rabbi Mordechai Kesterman, a rabbi in Lakewood. He told me from Rav Hirsch, who was a uh, one a very prominent German rabbi who uh, fought against reform and was really, it was because of him that orthodoxy survived in Germany um, in the 1800s. So he writes that we often think that after we pass away, we're going to be judged on our collective lives, right? Do we do live a good life or a bad life? And we'll get judged. But he writes, that's not how it works. We actually get judged every, every moment that we're alive. Did we use that moment to the fullest potential? He says, people live often... Right? They're looking forward to something, but they don't live what they're doing now because they're just looking forward to something in the future and they totally ignore what they're doing. That's not how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live where each moment where we're alive that we can accomplish something. You know, I was just talking to someone earlier. You know, you're sitting in traffic. What are you going to do? You could think. You could daven. You could say to Hillam. You could think about trusting in Hashem. You could think about what areas of, uh, you know, we could think about what areas of our lives need improvement and uh, how to work on our character traits and how to be nicer to people, how we can improve in mitzvah observance. When you're sitting in traffic, there's always something that we can be doing every moment of the day um, to, uh, to improve and to serve Hashem. The idea is that we're not always like looking forward to and ignoring the moment now, but that we will get judged for every moment and did we live a full life with every, every second that we could. Okay. So that's that. So, that, so until now we were talking about Mars and Machpelah, and now the next thing. Avraham wants to get a wife for Yitzchak. So how does he do that? Let's go to page 110. Next page. Okay. 24 Let's read the... So, okay. So... Let's start, let's start from the Pasuk uh, Gimel here, 3, on page 110. So Avram wants to find a wife for Yitzhak, so he instructs his trusty servant, Eliezer, to go and find a wife. Now what does he tell him? He says, I want you to find a wife for Yitzhak, but don't get a Canaanite wife, a Canaanite wife for Yitzhak. Now what's interesting is Eliezer was a Canaanite, he was a Canaanite, and he had a daughter. Now you would think, that would be a very good match for Yitzchak because this was, again, Avraham's trusty servant who lived his whole life following Avraham around, trying to learn how to serve Hashem. But there was some... He wasn't some, Jewish. So what? He wasn't Jewish. He was a, right. He was a, but nobody was Jewish then. No, but he, right. he wasn't part of Avraham's family. Right. So what's special exactly? What's special about Avraham's family? Right? Avram's family, they were also idolaters. The Canaanites, the Canaanim were idolaters, and Avram's family were idolaters. So what was so bad about Canaan that Avram didn't want... A wife uh, from those people. So, if we go back, way back to Noah, page forty-three, who was Canaan, and who were his descendants? Came from right. This is the bad boy. Right. What? So, remember why Ham was bad? Let's read. Verse, page forty-three, nine, twenty, nine, twenty. Yeah, at the bottom, verse twenty. Right, Noah, after he got out of the ark, he planted a vineyard. He uh, got drunk, and he was uncovered. And Ham, the father of Canaan, who we're talking about now, he uncovered his father's nakedness, um, and he told his uh, brothers outside. Now there's a Two opinions, what he did, he either castrated his father or he uh, had relations with his father. Very, he uncovered his nakedness, a very disgusting, deplorable act. So I heard this from, uh, from my reshiva, Rav Aaron Feldman, that the point of the sin of what Ham did, of uncovering his father's nakedness, is that he had no human dignity, no respect for human dignity. Why do we wear clothes? We wear clothes because we're human beings. We, what do clothes cover? Clothes cover the parts of our body that represent our physical desires, right? A person's face and his hands are what's uncovered. A person's face, you see, is personality. Because we are human beings, the human is the only creation that we've mentioned uh, that has a physical component and a spiritual component, right? Animals are totally physical. They just go after their instincts. Angels are totally spiritual. They're just these non-physical beings that get close to Hashem. A human being is the only cre part of creation that has a soul, that has a soul which wants to get close to Hashem, 
and has a body which is, has those animal instincts. So we wear clothes to show, to cover the animal instincts, to show that our goal in life is to get close to Hashem and to be on a higher level of existence, and we're not merely going after our physical pleasures. The Gemara and Shabbos says that the Rabbi Yochanan kari l'ma'ane mechabduse. Rabbi Yochanan used to clo- call his clothes his honor. Right? There were actually special garments that uh, rabbinical scholars used to wear because they were different than what everyone else's clothes because since they were Torah scholars and they were on this higher level of existence trying to learn what Hashem wanted and had a, more, uh, pr- had a larger appreciation and understanding of what God wanted for them so that, expre- uh, that expressed itself in, uh, in the clothes that they wore. Okay. Right? People are... Um, hey, what's up? How's it going? People are... Uh, we're just... We're, uh, p- people are naturally um, embarrassed to walk around without clothes, and uh, the clothes that they wear represent a, um, the covering of the physical to uh, have a life that is dedicated to the spiritual. That's why, right, always people, people say, like, how come in Lakewood they always wear the funny black hats and the, and the suits? The reason is, is like we're saying, that the Torah scholars, right, these people, I mean, not all of them are studying Torah anymore, but they all started that they were studying Torah and in yeshiva, and they... Uh, they wear these clothes to demonstrate that they are studying Torah and are trying to achieve a higher level of a spiritual existence. Um, in, there's a yeshiva in Europe called Slabatka, which actually um, a lot of yeshivas in America, they come, or on page uh, 110, they, com- they come from this, uh, I think we're all, yeah. They come from, uh, Lakewood is actually started by a student of Slabatka, so was Neri Israel in Baltimore, a lot of different yeshivas. In Slabatka, they were known that they dressed very fancy. They used to walk around with hats and canes, like very dapper. And there was uh, Rabbi Ruderman, who was the founder of the yeshiva that I went to. Uh, he asked someone to get his jacket, and he thought it was his jacket hanging up, and there was a stain on it. So someone told him, there's no way that's his jacket. He would never have a stain on his jacket. Right? There's something to be said about people who walk around dignified with clothes, because it shows that a human being is different than an animal, that we were all created in God's image, we all have a soul, and we all therefore yearn to get close to Hashem. Right? And that's the reason there's a commandment to treat others with respect, because we're all created in the image of God, and every human being is a holy person who is created in God's image. We're not just an animal. And uh, we have to use our high level and intellect to follow the mitzvahs and serve Hashem. There's, uh, okay, fine. Uh, that's, uh, that's that. So let's go on. Oh, so now, so now Eliezer, so that's the reason why Eliezer wasn't able, Avram didn't want Eliezer to get a wife for his son Yitzchak, from Canaan, because Canaan embodied this total lack of human dignity, who was willing to go into his father's tent and uncover his nakedness. He didn't care about the respect and the whole goal of a human to get close to Hashem and not to just serve his physical pleasures. Now, how did El- what, what did Eliezer do to find um, a wife for Yitzchak? What was he looking for? We're starting here. One second, please. So let's see, 24.14 on page 108. We're back on 108. Is it 108? Maybe not 108. Oh, sorry, it's on 110. So Eliezer goes and he sees, he says, I'm going to make a sign. I want, if somebody does this, if a girl does this, I know that she's the girl that I want to marry my master's son, Yitzchak. So what is it? Vahaya Hanara Asher Amar Eleha Hatina Kadech Veeshte. The woman who says that here, take some water and you can drink it. Vamra Shasei Vigam Gamalecha Ashke. You should drink, and your camel should drink. She'll bring. Also Hochachta Laavda Chalitzak Uva Eida Kiasis Chesedi Madaini. If she does that, she offers water to me, and she offers water to the camels. Then I know that she is the right girl for Yitzchak. That she is the one that Avraham wants me to get. So what is it that? Eliezer asks for someone who's going to do kindness. Chesed. We gotta figure out how this thing works. Okay, one day we'll get a we'll get a class. The the main criteria to find a wife for Yitzhak was kindness, midos, good character traits. Somebody who cares about other people, willing to go out of her way. Again, when Eliezer came, this this is what happened. She was a little girl, and he's a grown man. And nevertheless, she goes and schleps water and puts it in the jugs and brings all this water to Eliezer. And to what? Did you buzz? I didn't buzz. Oh, I guess I got in. Or someone else did. Must be in another room. There's another class. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Somebody buzzed. I didn't even. I thought I heard somebody buzz. Oh. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, it's good for us. If somebody just walked in. I mean, 
Yeah. You, you I didn't, guess the rabbi didn't come in here, did he? in another room. No. Yeah. yeah, there's another class, I think, in like five minutes. Yeah, yeah. We, got, like, we got like five minutes, four minutes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it was chesed. That's what, um, that's what was important. Someone with good character traits. Now, if you notice, again, we were talking about why Avraham, when he bought the, um, the cave to bury Sarah, why that was mentioned so long in the Torah. But that is nothing compared to this part of the Torah. Because if you look from page... One, 111 to 115, it tells the whole story about how Eliezer went, traveled to Abraham's family, said, this will be the sign that I want for a girl to marry Yitzchak. And it happened, and it describes the whole thing back and forth about how she brought all the water to the camels and how she was such a nice person. So that goes on from 111 to 115, which is very long. And then you have from page 115 to 117, Eliezer goes and repeats the entire story to, to, uh, to Besuel and Lavan, to, uh, to uh, Rivka's father and brother. So why in the world does the Torah go on for so long, so many pages, to talk about this? Now again, just to make the question stronger, hopefully in Vayikra, when we're learning, in Leviticus, you're going to see there's many laws which are only derived from, again, an extra letter in the Torah. The Talmud will say, you know, oh, since there's an extra word or an extra letter, we learn many, many laws. So why over there does the Torah so concise, but over here it goes on and on and on to talk about this story? What is so important? So on page 116... 2442, in Rashi, on the bottom, 42, Gamata, it's 44, 42, it says, I'm going to translate, Vavo hayom, hayom, is it? Mikan shekam, Amar avi acha, yafes yichasen shal avdi avos, shal avdi avos, lifnei amakam, mitarasen shal banam. Greater is the speech of the servants of our forefathers than the Torah of their children. Shari parsha shall Eliezer kfula b'Torah. This parsha of Eliezer finding a wife for Yitzchak is repeated in the Torah. V'harbe gufe Torah lo not no lo nisno elab remiza. And many parts of the Torah are only hinted to. Like we said, many laws from the Torah are only hinted to, while this parsha goes on and on. So again, the reason is is because this parsha of Eliezer teaches us good midos, good character traits, that he was looking for a wife for Yitzchak. And what was the thing that he was looking for? What was important in a spouse was someone who's kind, someone who was caring. And also, the R- Rabbi Moshe Einstetter wrote, who I quoted him earlier, that the Rambam writes that there were four individuals that always thought about God in everything they did. That was the four, the four fathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and Moshe Rabbeinu. Those four individuals in human history... Every action that they did, even when they weren't praying or even when they weren't studying Torah, they were always thinking of Hashem, always thinking of God. And Eliezer, who was... It, it's for another class. Don't buzz them in. Oh, there we go. Eliezer, who was the servant of Avraham, who made it his life's mission to learn what it is to be a good person and what it means to do what God expects from you, expects from you was a reflection of Avraham, of a human being who lived just to serve Hashem. So that's why the Torah goes on and on to describe his actions, because there's so much we can learn from what he did from an individual who just dedicates himself to, um, to serving Hashem. And Rav Einsteiner points out uh, a truism that the measure of a person isn't how he acts when he's at synagogue praying or when he's studying Torah, it's how he acts in the normal activities. And Eliezer was a person who just imbibed and inculcated all those lessons into himself to the point where all of his life was living according to what Hashem wanted from him. So the Torah goes on and on because from this story we learn character traits, right? If a person doesn't have good character traits, is not a God-fearing person, he can learn all the Torah in the world and it's worthless, right? The Nefesh Chaim talks about that to really, to, Torah study is not like any other wisdom. You could be a horrible person and you could, uh, you know, you could um, be a de- be a genius, basically. There was an, I forgot who it was, but there was an ethics professor that was accused of some, like, I don't know, like sexual harassment or something, like some really bad stuff. And they asked him, like, you're an ethics professor, how could you do that? So he answered, you know, is the ge- geometry teacher a triangle, right? Just because I teach ethics doesn't mean I'm an ethical person. That's not how it works in Torah. To be a true Torah scholar, you have to live what the Torah teaches. It says that the fearing Hashem, being a good person, and taking the lessons of the Torah, that's like the storehouse, and the Torah is the grain. If you just learn Torah, you, don't, you just have the grain, and you don't have the storehouse protecting it, you don't have the fear of heaven to protect it, then the Torah is worthless. So that's why we learn from Eliezer, we learn of what it is to be a good Jew, to have good character traits, what's important, and that he acted uh, in a godly way, even when he wasn't uh, in, the, in the shul or in the, in the study hall. And then, of course, Rivka goes back with Eliezer and marries Yitzchak. Avraham remarries and then passes away. And that brings us to our next Parsha, which I hope to see you next week.
Uh, I know what my sponsor. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, guys. Good? Okay. Thank you.